Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Tomasz Baranczyk. I'm a tax partner at uh, PwC Poland. Uh, as we all know, Poland is coming across uh, major tax regulatory changes uh, since 1990. The whole tax regulatory package uh, known as, as the Polish deal is to be introduced uh, as from beginning of uh, 2022, pretty soon. Uh, key changes to be introduced include, among others, uh, minimum tax for companies uh, incurring tax losses or profitable below, below 1%. There is a new set of uh, tax burdens uh, imposed on employees and uh, board members. There is a new set of uh, tax reliefs as well as uh, additional transfer pricing restrictions. This whole regulatory change uh, is attracting a lot of interest uh, uh, of businesses operating uh, in Poland. Uh, from initial impact assessment to working out solutions, often going beyond pure tax matters, uh, CFOs, tax directors uh, will have to work out uh, what to do uh, with the Polish deal implementation. Our aim today is, is to help you working out uh, such solutions. Uh, so hopefully you will enjoy uh, the, the everything that we prepared for you today, starting from, of course, uh, trying to uh, review uh, impact on investors uh, coming from Polish deal. We will then uh, go through international taxes, transfer pricing changes, uh, personal income tax implications of the Polish deal. Of course, uh, broadening your uh, understanding of uh, what minimal tax changes and other uh, changes, uh, amendments made to the Polish uh, CIT law brings to you. Uh, as someone once said, uh, forgetting is painful, but not knowing what to do is the worst kind of suffering. Uh, and our aim today is not to let you suffer and le learn from our specialists uh, what comes from the, from the new Polish deal. Let me first uh, turn to uh, Professor Witold Orłow Orłowski to give uh, his assessment of, of the Polish deal changes, and then we will go to other sections of uh, today's meeting. Thank you. Hello, welcome. My name is, my name is Vita Torosti, I'm Chief Economic Advisor to PwC in Poland. Uh, let me uh, start on something that uh, I wouldn't even call the introduction to the Polish deal because uh, uh, you will hear a lot about the Polish deal in, in a moment. Uh, I will give you the overview of um, uh, where, where is the Polish economy at that point what to expect, and uh, maybe by the end of the day, some remarks how the Polish did, what, what, what impact it can have on, on, on the Polish uh, economy. Uh, hopefully, I will be able to change the slides, so the general overview. Okay, it, it will not be basically the, the beginning about the deal, it will be about the, the situation. I mean, the first point to be made is that, uh, well, you know, Poland is still in the, in the, in the middle of the pandemic crisis, we've got the fourth wave. Uh, as you see, uh, the fourth wave seems to be approaching its, its, its peak. And uh, moreover, whatever were the reasons, uh, the government did not introduce any, any serious lockdown measures during this fourth wave. Uh, virtue or, 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 or the lack of the, uh, ability to do whatever was the reason. Uh, the point is that, uh, on the one hand, obviously it means more people dying. On the other hand, it means, uh, well, sorry to say, but less economic losses because uh, because the the the, deal is, uh, the the because the situation is uh, well medically from a medical point of view is is pretty bad from the economic point of view looks uh, much more normal. Uh, as you may know or not, uh, Poland is not uh, leading in the vaccination. Uh, and this is not because of the lack of the vaccines. This is because only, let's say, slightly more than half of the population decided to take the, 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 the vaccination. And uh, given that, uh, we are now in the situation which uh, we don't know what will happen with the pandemics uh, later. It seems that uh, first there are the risks of obviously of the virus itself being more nasty and, and the Omicron uh, 
variant and the other variants of mutating model, uh, virus may prolong very much the, 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 the problems. Uh, in Poland, uh, well, definitely we should learn to how to live with the coronavirus, maybe for, for, for many years. But uh, it looks that uh, there is no big risk of the further big lockdowns, at least for the time being. So what was the story until now? Well, in a sense, not, not, not very nice because the pandemics already caused a huge, huge, huge economic impact, negative economic impact. And uh, Poland is not the only country. More, moreover, I would say, compared to the other big European countries, Poland has been doing pretty well. We had only less than 3% of the GDP drop last year. Uh, this year, we obviously got some rebuilding of the economic activity. So uh, we'll see, but uh, it seems that um, the situation in Poland is, is economic, from an economic point of view, is not dramatic. As I said, no long, not for the lockdowns. Uh, what the government decided in Poland was, uh, well, exactly the same that all the European governments did, uh, with Germany leading the pact, if you wish, uh, deciding that uh, whatever is the drop of the GDP of the output, and in the case of Spain, you had the drop temporarily almost 20% and 12% yearly base. So a huge drop of the GDP. No, under normal condition, you would have the increase of the unemployment. The policy was, no, 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 let's stop the, the unemployment at any cost. Let's avoid the unemployment. Uh, and that policy was successful, but unfortunately, at a, at a, at a huge fiscal cost because it was the government who was paying the, the, the salary. So as you see in Poland, there was hardly any increase of the unemployment. There was some, but, but very little, uh, as in other countries. Okay, in the case of uh, Italy, for example, you had uh, almost 10% of the drop of the GDP compared with the fall of the unemployment. So it's showing the, 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 the policy. Basically, uh, this policy worked in a sense of uh, uh, counteracting the, the unemployment, but at a huge fiscal cost, but also the, in, I would say, a monetary cost, because uh, because of what I will show in a moment, because at the moment when the government had to borrow incredible amount of money, in the case of Poland, it was something like uh, almost 10% of GDP of the extra, extra um, sales of, 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 of bonds, 8%, let's say, uh, in such a situation, the only buyer available was a central bank, and the central bank was printing the money, if you wish, or creating the money to, to pay for that. And that was the story everywhere. So there was a massive increase of the money. Where is Poland now, and what are the prospects? If you look at the um, data, we've got the data until the third quarter of, uh, of this year, but I'm not showing you the rates of growth. Because they are quite misleading in a situation when we've got big drops and rebuilding and so on. So, so the so-called effect of the base that is really making the numbers look strange. I, I would rather show you the level of output and various categories, uh, seasonally adjusted. Uh, so uh, let's say if the normal level in the third quarter of 2019, so before the pandemic was 100, then you can see here on the left side the GDP at, and the demand components. The GDP, the GDP in Poland, well, was down pretty much in the second quarter of 2020, and then started to grow. And now it's uh, quite nicely some three percent above the pre-crisis uh, level. Uh, so um, doesn't look bad. Uh, as you can see, it was mainly, and now we are approaching the slightly web side of the story, mainly because of the consumption it was maintained. There was hardly after the second quarter, the immediate effect. Later, there was no fall of the unemployment or the, of the consumption towards the increase of the consumption, partly financed by the government debt. And uh, on the top of that, Poland had a, a very good export performance during the whole period. The exports is 
seriously higher than it was before the, the pandemics. And the only the only worrying point is the fall of the investment. The investment is still some five percent below the pre pre uh, crisis level. If you look by sector, then you see that well, apart from government services, that's that's obviously the health service and so on, so on doing pretty well in the, during the pandemics. But the industry in Poland recovered very quickly after the initial fall, and actually it's up to the it's thanks to the industry that the GDP is is is, is positive GDP growth. While services are hardly approaching the pre-crisis level, in some cases obviously not in the Horeca not, and the construction is still is still underperforming. Um, what are the prospects? I would say probably four to between four and five percent this year of GDP growth. But the next year, I gave you uh, three to five percent, depending on many elements. But first of all, about the stories about the EU COVID recovery fund. Uh, as you know, Poland and the other EU countries are entitled to participating in a huge uh, program of, of, of uh, investment financed by the EU funds. EU funds that are collected on the market, but uh, kind of guaranteed by, by all the countries, including Germany. So, so um, very, very, very convenient way of getting money. Poland was expected to get something like 10% of GDP to spend over two or three years. So my assessment was this something like it was something like one 1.5% of the additional GDP growth uh, this year, so only due to the demand effect of, the, of spending this money. But as you probably know, Poland is now the Polish government is in a quarrel with the EU institutions on the rule of law issues. Uh, the reforms of the judiciary, and because of that, this, this, those money are, are frozen for the time being. So, depending on will they appear or not, there will be a let's say three percent growth or or five percent growth next next year. That, that, that's my assessment. Uh, as I said, everywhere in the world, the uh, fight with the pandemics was connected to the huge increase of the of the debt. In Poland, we had something like almost eight percent of the government uh, deficit uh, because of the eight percent of the value of the extra package to, to save the economy. Plus, there are the uh, loans, the, the, the credit guarantees. So, it may not be the end of the story of the increase. The increase of the debt may be even higher. Uh, Poland, fortunately, doesn't have a huge increase of a huge level of the debt. Uh, uh, we now, after the year 2020, we have uh, still less than 60% of GDP of the debt, but uh, but it is growing. This year, the deficit will be reduced because of the recovery and the unexpected inflation in a moment. But the next year is a big question mark. I mean, theoretically, the government uh, wants to reduce further the, the 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 deficit, but we'll see will it be able to do it. So, as everywhere in Poland, we've got the huge scale of the government intervention, the huge scale of the increase of the debt, the huge increase of the base money, 16% in the case of Poland. So, this is financing by the central bank. We call it printing money. Obviously, these days you do not print money, you just push the entity. Uh, and uh, that may lead to the future problems of unknown scale character, but the inflation seems to be a likely effect. And if you and the last point is about the uncertainty about the Polish inflation, because partly due to the um, external situation, due to the growing cost of the fuels, but partly also due to the to the supply side problems, connected with the con policy of uh, continuous uh, encouragement of the demand, consumer demand. That, by the way, was a policy Poland has been doing over the last years. Uh, we've got a very fast increase of the unemployment of the of the inflation rate. Everywhere in Europe, we, in the United States, we've got the, the increase of the inflation, but in Poland is stronger than elsewhere. From two percent in February to eight uh, percent uh, already in November. Now the government wants to slow down the further growth of the inflation by reducing some taxes temporarily. But basically, the problem exists. There is a risk of this inflationary spiral. So, 
So um, in a sense, uh, the inflation starts to be a big problem, and moreover, it starts to be a problem for the for the growth. And now the last point about the um, Polish uh, uh, deal. The Polish deal is basically about the redistribu change in the redistribution of the income. Uh, more income with poorer people, less more taxes for for, for richer ones. Uh, this is that's basically the the, the key of the, of the program. And unfortunately, this type of the program has got rather pro-inflationary uh, effect because uh, if you tax more the richer part of the society, the richer part of the society of the population has got higher saving rates. The poorer part of the population has got uh, lower saving uh, rates and or do not save at all. And basically, they spend all the extra money on, on, on the consumption. So um, the likely effect of the Polish deal is more consumption, higher, faster growth of the consumption. And that may fuel for the, 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 the inflation. So as I said, nobody has got a crystal ball, but it seems that the next year in Poland will be difficult. The growth will be here, obviously, depending on the EU deals faster or slower, but the inflation is unfortunately likely to, 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 to remain and to, to be still a big problem. Oh, that's, that's basically my, my point. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, or good evening, wherever you are. Uh, I'm supposed to spend several minutes on uh, speaking uh, about the changes uh, which may be important from the perspective of the capital transactions and intra-group restructurings, which will uh, enter into force in uh, our legislation from the beginning of the next year. By, but be, before I start, I was told that you have the possibility to, to ask questions through a chat, uh, because the technology, I suppose, allows for this. And I uh, invite you to do so. Uh, you know, when I first read the, 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 the Polish deal changes into the uh, Polish income tax uh, laws, personal income tax and corporate income tax, my first impression was that it's a kind of the most philosophical change I have ever seen in the change into the Polish uh, tax legislation. And this is uh, the uh, impression because uh, these changes uh, allow you and allow us all to ask a lot of questions and some of these questions, a big sum, I would say, uh, don't have clear answers. Uh, so uh, if you face any questions, please, uh, please uh, be invited to uh, ask them through a chat to the extent we know the answers and we'll be able to respond during the, uh, during the webinarium. We will do it. Uh, if not, we will come back to you with the responses to the extent, to the extent we know the responses afterwards. But uh, coming to the uh, changes which are important from the investor's perspective, um, this is the another year of the changes which uh, I would say uh, are supposed to uh, heal the trauma the legislation in Poland had uh, when uh, a few years ago, I think seven years as of now, the Polish tax regulations were very flexible from the perspective of uh, the tax burdens and for the couple of years now the changes have been uh, made uh, in order to close the loopholes which I think are not existing anymore already for a couple of years so if you are familiar to some extent with the Polish tax system you know that we have uh, a lot of anti-abuse regulations general anti-abuse regulations specific anti-abuse regulations but we have also a lot of the technical regulations which we mil which limit uh, or which uh, do not allow to uh, have some uh, benefits, or I would say to some extent, even some tax neutrality on the restructuring transactions and on the financing of the capital transactions. And we have another year of uh, some additional limitations, but uh, there are also some good news. So not only bad news this time with respect to uh, investing in Poland. And let me shortly, because the changes are pretty extensive, uh, cover the ones which I think might be of most interest to you. Uh, the first uh, group of changes, uh, which uh, it, which is pretty uh, pretty uh, extensive when, into, when you look into the legislation, but overall they are uh, very similar with respect to different restructuring transactions, are around tax neutrality of uh, capital restructurings, uh, which uh, we uh, say are 
shares for share exchange. So if you have the intra-group restructuring and you are transferring the shares in uh, one entity into another entity for the newly issued shares, as well as the contribution of the business is going concern plus legal mergers and demergers. And the changes are a little different uh, with respect to all four group of restructurings, but basically they are around the same condition. So on the top of the conditions which we have so far on the, uh, on the restructuring to allow us for them to be tax neutral, there are two more and they apply to all, uh, all four restructurings. The first one is that uh, the shares which are subject to restructuring. So in the case of the contribution kind of the shares, the shares which are contributed in kind, with respect to the legal merger, the shares in the company which is being merged into another company, with respect to demerger, the shares in the company which are subject to demerger, so they are cancelled as a result of the demerger, cannot be uh, the shares which the shareholder obtained in a previous restructuring transaction. So Let's assume that we have a, a contribution kind of shares. If we purchase the shares, we can still, if we fulfill the previous conditions, make them tax neutral. But if you have the shares which you obtained through a previous restructuring transaction, like as a result of the legal merger or legal demerger or previous share for share exchange, you cannot assume tax neutrality for uh, you as a shareholder. So for such shares, the situation would uh, be treated the same as if the shares were sold. So if we have the contribution kind of the shares, uh, when the shares were not purchased, but the shares were, for example, obtained uh, as a result of the legal merger, you would be treated as if, 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 as if you sold the shares, uh, recognizing the capital gain on the transaction. For the shareholders which are not Polish tax residents, we can uh, try to apply the exemption uh, based on the double tax treaty, uh, assuming that we have the access to the proper tax treaty. So not in every case this taxation would in fact occur, but this is something which needs to be taken care of. And the second condition which applies to the transactions uh, of uh, the one which I mentioned is the uh, requirements that the shareholder on the new shares acquired, so in the case of the share for share exchange, the shares in the company B on the uh, on the picture, and in the case of the legal merger, the shares in the surviving company, so company which issues new shares to the shareholder, in the case of the merger, the shares in the new company or the company which takes over the demerged part of business, cannot be assumed into the books of the uh, shareholder at the tax value which is different than the tax value of the uh, old shares, so the shares in the uh, company uh, which were merged or demerged or contributed in kind. And this is definitely the case uh, for the Polish shareholders because the Polish tax law does not allow to any change here, but if we have the shareholders which are not Polish ones, this needs to be tested. The problem might be that uh, in some situations, the companies which are subject <coughs> sorry, to restructurings are obliged to remit the tax for the shareholders. So for the companies which are subject to legal demerger or legal merger, or uh, the ones which uh, are uh, receiving the contribution kind of the business, they may be required to check the shareholders and to check first the history of the shares of the shareholders. So why, so how would these shareholders obtained, uh, acquired the shares? and also uh, the results of the uh, restructuring. So what's the uh, tax treatment of the shares which are being uh, subscribed at the, at, the, at the moment of the restructuring. And this may be not the uh, very difficult situation if you have one shareholders, uh, one share or two shareholders, but if you have a lot of shareholders, if you are a public entity, this may be much more difficult situation. So uh, this is something which we need to take in mind when we would be discussing about restructuring in Poland uh, for the uh, situations which will be occurring uh, in the next year. Uh, the, the second uh, point which may be important is that uh, the new uh, legislation would limit the possibility to have the tax de depreciation of the real estate and simplifying there are two, uh, two points. The first one is that residential uh, buildings and apartments are not depreciable anymore or will not be depreciable anymore from the beginning of the next year. And uh, the second uh, situation is relevant for the corporations 
which are treated as the real estate companies. So the companies which uh, majority of the assets is uh, consisting of the real estate and the revenue in majority is also uh, derived from the uh, passive using of this real estate. The definition is already known because it has been already used for some reasons in the Polish uh, tax system. Uh, but uh, the additional limitation is that uh, the tax depreciation on the real estate in these companies cannot be higher than the accounting depreciations. And this may be uh, the problem particularly in the cases when for the accounting purposes, the company is treating its real estate not as a fixed asset subject to depreciation, but as an investment when do no depreciation for accounting purposes is being recognized. So this may result in the situation that such a company will not be able to depreciate the real estate also for tax purposes, which definitely would uh, increase substantially effective tax rates for such companies. So uh, for the real estate rich companies, the uh, uh, task is to check the balance sheet uh, and the financial statements as they will look like in the next year and to check whether this would not impact negatively the tax depreciation possibility for tax purposes as well. Point number three, uh, the new uh, provision would uh, disallow any interest and other debt-related cost to be tax deductible if the uh, debt was taken for capital transactions. They are not defined in the law, but uh, there is an open list of the situations which are classified as capital transactions and most obvious ones are shares acquisition. So if you take the debt to acquire the shares in another company, including partnerships, this interest will not be tax deductible if the loan is taken from the related party. And uh, we have already uh, a number of the limitations of the interest uh, as tax deductible on the capital transactions in law as of now, because we have the basketing, so operational uh, cost cannot be merged with the capital cost. So this limited to some extent deductibility of the interest on acquisition of shares already. We also have already in the law, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> we have also already in the law the ban on uh, tax deductibility of interest against the operational income of the company to the acquisition of which the loan was taken. We have also, uh, of course, the EBDA uh, interest uh, limitations, but we would have a new one, which is, I would say, pretty simple. So if you have related party loan on capital transaction, the interest is not tax deductible. So for that reason, if you plan to acquire the shares and to finance it with the external debt, the much better situation is take the unrelated party loan for this acquisition, rather than uh, take uh, some uh, intra-group financing. Uh, in the case within the group, we, you have some extra, uh, extra sorry, not extra, but you have some uh, uh, unrelated party financing. So from this perspective, really, it needs to be pretty uh, carefully considered how to finance the acquisition of shares. And the good information is that if you have unrelated party loan, which is secured, against the warranty uh, or in any other ways away by related party this is not something which poison poisons this uh, this uh, this debt so still this would be okay and the second point around debt financing is that uh, we have already as probably any other eu territory the limitation of the interest and other debt uh, financing cost uh, limited by ebdda uh, and the uh, cap is, uh, as provided by the EU, as 30% of the tax EBDA. So far, the rules were not clear, but the practice was that we take uh, as the limit of the calculation of the interest 30% of the tax EBDA in a tax year, plus uh, 3 million police lots, which is approximately 700,000 uh, 700, euro. Uh, the law is uh, changing from the 1st January next year in order, at least as it is stated in the, uh, in the, in the uh, justification or explanation to this change, to be clear, then this is not plus uh, 3 million Polish lots, but this is uh, or uh, uh, 3 million Polish lots. So you take into account 30% of the tax EBDA, and to the extent that the result of this calculation is below 3 million Polish lots, you can treat full interest is tax deductible, but if this is above, uh, you uh, cannot treat uh, any uh, anymore. But uh, as we read the law, it is not 
pretty clearly uh, stated. So this or is with the question mark. So we see how the practice would look like. Uh, point number four, uh, and this is a positive one, uh, and this uh, is around the holding company regime, which is, uh, I would say, almost for the first time, the one, something which allows to have a participation exemption on the capital investment uh, being done by the Polish entity. And the benefits of Polish holding company will would be that uh, there would be a tax exemption on the capital gain from the sale of the shares in subsidiaries with the condition that it needs to be the sale to the unrelated party, plus the dividends received from such subsidiaries are exempt up to 55%. And this is the uh, good thing. Uh, there are some limitations. Uh, a pretty long list of limitations, I would say. The ones which... Uh, I would like to focus on our first. It doesn't apply to real estate companies. And there is one condition which is not fully understandable by us because it says that this uh, regime cannot be applied if the holding company benefits from the EU related directive exemption on the dividends received. And we are, don't understand whether this is the situation that you have the theoretical right to uh, benefit from this exemption, but you don't utilize this exemption because you don't receive dividends or you don't decide to use this exemption because you have this 95% exemption or this has some other meaning but I hope that in the next several weeks or few months some explanations from the Minister of Finance would be issued here to allow uh, to allow uh, practical uh, use of this uh, regime. There are a couple of other conditions which would which may mean that the practical uh, practical possibility to use this regime would be limited, but nevertheless, uh, still this is something which worth considering. The ones which uh, I would like to mention is that uh, there may be only two-tier structure to have the exemption. So you can apply uh, the regime of the holding company only if you have the shares in subsidiaries, but these subsidiaries cannot the shares in other entities. Or to be precise, they can have the shares, but only up to 5% of the shareholding in those companies. So uh, multi-tier structures would not be uh, would not be uh, able to use uh, this uh, regime. There are some other conditions which you have on on the slides. I think that what's maybe also important is that uh, when you look up the structure, so above holding, you cannot have the as a direct or indirect shareholders and entity which is. Uh, which is uh, the resident of the uh, territory which is uh, classified as applying harmful, harmful tax competition, comp comp sorry, uh, competition like uh, Britain, Virgin Islands, like uh, like Monaco and a couple of other territories. The risk is fortunately not very long, but, but this, is, this may be some limitations. And there are also some other ones like the, the, the neither of the companies, so uh, holding company and a subsidiary cannot utilize from the uh, special economic zone or the Polish investment zone exemption. So a couple of limitations apply, but nevertheless, it is worth considering whether this may not be something which may be interesting to, to be applied. And the last uh, point, uh, also positive uh, from uh, my side, is that uh, among the big uh, or the long list of the tax reliefs which are being implemented uh, into as a part of the Polish deal and my colleague Mietek will uh, will talk about it uh, in more detail later. There are two ones which apply specifically to capital transactions. The first one is IPO relief. So if we have the entity uh, who which is planning the first IPO, uh, some expenses which are uh, to be borne to prepare uh, to uh, be uh, quoted uh, on the... Uh, public exchange can be on the top, of course, of their tax deductibility, uh, be used additionally to decrease your tax uh, tax uh, taxable base, and those are uh, investment. Sorry, those are expenses on prospectus. Uh, some uh, additional fees which are required to be borne when you uh, plan to go IPO plus advisory services, but the advisory services are capped at pretty low levels. So. It's 50,000 slots, approximately 12,000 euros, so it is really not something which is a substantial amount. And the second relief is, uh, I called it Odoni relief. So if you have the company which is operational company and have the uh, business activity and the company acquires the shares in another entity from unrelated party uh, with the same business or a complementary business to the one you held, 
uh, you have as a, as, a, as a purchaser, you can, uh, you can treat some of the costs uh, which are related to the acquisition of these companies as additional deduction from your tax base. Uh, this is also limited and the limit is also not very huge, but this is much bigger compared to the IPO relief. This is to uh, 50,000 police lots, which is approximately 70,000 euros. So uh, maybe this is not something which is worth a big exercise, but nevertheless, if you have the situation that you, that you have, that you have odd on, so we acquired the company which uh, odds on to your existing business, this is worth to remember and use this additional deduction when uh, when uh, when the conditions are being met. And that's uh, it from my side. If you have any questions, please uh, ask them on chat. I will be here, uh, so I will be able to answer at least some of them. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, now we continue with international taxes and transfer pricing aspects. So again, like a continuation of, of restructuring topics, mostly for corporate world. My name is Agata Octavis. I'm partner with tax uh, department in PwC. And with me is today Sebastian Lebda, who is transfer pricing partner with PwC. Whatever. <laughs> okay, so we will start with withholding tax. So that's a big change and actually a very sort of, we, we've been waiting for that change actually to come because the first year when the changes were introduced was 2018 or actually notified. But then the, the rules have been suspended and we've been living in certain uncertainty. So you might have heard about that, but 2022, that will be actually the year where when the changes will kick in in full. What will change is that for payments to a related party, you will see your Polish subsidiary will asking a number of questions around the substance, around the beneficial owner, and in order to be able to sign a statement um, to get some sort of a pre-clearance and access to the treaty or to directives. Uh, so this is actually the major change. So in order to get to the treaty, uh, the board will need to do uh, withholding tax due diligence. If the due diligence is not successful, then uh, they will need to uh, withhold uh, withholding tax and, and then uh, apply so-called pay and refund mechanism. Uh, the people who are responsible for signing the statements uh, will be those uh, who are responsible or, or who actually represent the company. So not the whole board, but at least uh, those persons who represent the company. The pay and refund mechanism will not apply to services, uh, which, which was the case uh, until the rules have, have, have changed. Um, you may, or there is an option to apply for a pre-clearance opinion uh, to tax authorities, which will be binding for three years. But of course, it takes time to get such an opinion around six months. So, so from January, from the first payment, uh, the threshold will need to be looked at. And therefore, uh, well, you may you may uh, see your Polish subsidiaries uh, living in, a, I would say, a two, two, two kinds of awards. So one, making the due diligence and while waiting for the opinion. The withholding tax changes also modified uh, the beneficial ownership definition. So there is some relaxation around that definition. Uh, I think the major one is around uh, the need uh, to take into account the scale uh, and the character of the business, yes. So, so we do see some rationalization of 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 those, um, let's say, requirement around withholding tax. Uh, the next three items that I'll just talk very briefly are around the changes uh, in the area of current uh, co uh, controlled foreign companies. I think the biggest change here is that the the rate uh, to which uh, you know we are comparing, yes, whether whether the uh, the, the foreign activities are, let's say, okay, yes, if I may call it like that. The, the rate needs to be at least 14.25. Uh, um, the, uh, the catalog of activities has been extended actually to include, uh, well, services, also rental or, or lease income. And there are two new tests um, on the top of those who have already been existing in the laws. And one of these tests is actually look, looking um, 
at the profitability on the assets that are, uh, let's say, within the entity. So if there is a holding company, uh, which actually does not really receive much, but say some interest or some dividends that effectively allow that company to reach less than 30% return on its asset, that company may be deemed to be a CFC. Uh, if, of course, there is no, let's say, uh, business substance there for EU uh, or EOG uh, entities. So that's like one test. And that test uh, is, is, let's say, I would say extremely dangerous because it allows actually not uh, the CFC not to be taxed only at 19%, but actually at 8% of the value of assets which are held by that company unless other tests are met. Uh, the other test um, will actually targets companies who are deriving less uh, than 75% of, of revenues from the country where they are based. And there are some detailed rules around it. But I think the key message around the CFC is that if you have a, a Polish entity who does have certain subsidiaries, please make sure you screen all these subsidiaries through new CFC rules because they are actually targeting also operational business. Uh, the other change concerns tax residents. So actually the definition of, of tax residents and that definition is expanded onto the cases whereby po I mean, people that are placed in Poland uh, are uh, taking part in, uh, let's say, activities of a foreign entity on, on a daily basis and in a so-called organized manner by way of a proxy or some sort of an agreement. So again, uh, the situations where uh, the Polish, the, the foreign subsidiary has been actually, uh, let's say, subcontracting certain services uh, to, uh, to a Polish uh, either individual or a company, these are the cases to be looked at in terms of residency. Obviously, uh, if you are in a treaty, treaty situation, then the tiebreaker rules uh, should apply. Still, uh, one attention point based on the treaties it is not always certain whether the, the two states will reach an agreement. So that is something to be observed around the tax residency. Well, there is, the, the rules also introduce the concept of tax amnesty. So those who believe they have sort of did wrong when it comes to paying the taxes, so they have not declared income or maybe misused the treaty, uh, those can actually, uh, let's say, in a way, say sorry to tax authorities and 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 declare voluntarily uh, the missing tax items. There is a short slot to do so from 1st October till March 2023. And the basis, which is quite, or, or the tax rate is quite attractive because it's only 8% without the need of paying any penalty interest, late interest payments, uh, no uh, personal liability. And, and, and what is quite important or interesting is that uh, you may ask a, an advisor to actually ask the tax authorities on a no-name basis whether a given case applies uh, or, or can be subject to tax amnesty. So quite, quite a, a, an interesting concept. Um, in Poland, we used to have a rule uh, which uh, sort of uh, introduced some limitations on tax deductibility of so-called intangible services, a very famous Article 15E. Uh, and that article was actually repelled but replaced uh, with with some various con with, with various concepts, and one of them uh, is a concept of tax on shifted income, so-called shifted income. So by by shifted income, we mean uh, or the new law means uh, payments for uh, intangible services, uh, for financing, royalties, and and payments for uh, transfer of risks. Uh, should such payments take place and on the top of that, the receiving entity taxes them below 14.25% uh, and that entity uh, has a nature of a business that actually whereby such payments represents more than 50% of its revenues. And that, pa uh, that, that payment, th that recipient makes or transfers on the payments, um, either via dividend or is in a back-to-back -back, uh, transaction. Uh, such payments made by a Polish entity uh, may be subject to tax. So yes, the cost 
the cost on the side of a Polish company may actually be uh, taxable. Uh, the way to get out of this role is to make sure that the, the recipient of the payment conducts true business activity. So that's, I would say, a new compliance requirement to, to be able to prove that an entity conducts real business. And that applies only to EU um, uh, EAE, uh, EEA uh, companies. I hand over to Sebastian. Okay. <clears throat> So maybe maybe a few words about uh, changes from a transfer pricing perspective. Um, there are a number of, of the changes which have been introduced. However, I think uh, uh, there are two which may be of interest to you. The first change that I would like to talk about is a hidden dividend. The second concept that uh, I wanted to talk later is uh, TP documentation for the transactions with unrelated parties. So quite unique concept. Now, moving to the to the first uh, first uh, item, Agata already mentioned that uh, the famous Article 15E, which was so far in 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 the law, has been removed. This article actually was uh, limiting the det deductibility of the different royalty payment and management charges. Uh, however, in 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 place of this article, we have like different different things which have been introduced, and, and actually one probably critical one is this uh, regulation on the hidden dividend. Uh, what this regulation basically says, it says that if a certain payment to a related party would be classified as a hidden dividend, then this payment would be tax non-deductible, and that's it. Now. The current definition of a hidden, hidden dividend includes three types of cost categories. The first type of a cost category, these are the costs uh, where the value or the moment of payment depends on either earning a profit at all or depends on the amount of the profit. Um, okay, the concept per se seems really like uh, that it su suggests that this can be treated as a kind of a hidden dividend. However, the the issue here is that if you if you think about number of structures from a transfer pricing perspective, uh, you, you can notice easily that there are a number of transfer pricing adjustments. For example, in the contract manufacturing models, uh, in the limited risk distribution models, and quite often uh, there is obviously a transfer pricing adjustment uh, where the value of this adjustment depends on the profit which has been reported today. So one of the uncertainty here is really, I mean, uh, to what extent this, this regulation somehow contradicts with quite typical concepts which are in place already on the Polish market uh, from a transfer pricing angle. Now, the second cost category, uh, which is classified as a hidden dividend, these are the costs which reasonably acting taxpayer would not incur or could incur, but at a lower level when buying from a third party. Again, concept is, is quite, uh, quite strange uh, to, to see this, this kind of a phrase here because you can easily notice that it uh, duplicates to a large extent the existing transfer pricing regulations. However, the difference is that this regulation is much more stringent because in the transfer pricing case, if you have, for example, a cost of 100 and this 100 is being challenged by the tax authorities and after the challenge you have a cost of 90, the assessment is only 10. Uh, an additional tax is calculated on this 10. Whereas here, if the tax authorities prove that uh, a certain payment should be at a lower level, the entire amount, so in our case, the entire 100 becomes tax non-deductible. So uh, there are many uncertainties about this 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 kind of this this regulation, and and probably we will see some more explanations coming soon. Uh, but just to finish on 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 the on the third category, the third category of costs which can be classified as a hidden dividend, uh, the, these are the costs. Uh, where the Polish entity is paying to a related party for the rights to use some assets which were owned or co-owned by a shareholder, partner or related entity prior to establishing the taxpayer. Uh, again, uh, it's quite a strange concept to me at least because 
if you look at the Polish landscape, uh, you will see that most of the subsidiaries operating on the Polish market have been uh, established sometime after the multinational groups existed. Uh, and, and in many cases, uh, you have uh, the payments for the uh, right to use the know-how or, uh, or uh, for the right to use the trademarks, so it's royalty payments, which are being made to the entities which existed prior to establishing the taxpayer. So again, uh, quite... Quite frankly, uh, it's a quite a, a bizarre concept uh, here. So, as you can see, um, this this regulation is is at the moment uh, um, a quite unique one. And um, the good message is that it its introduction has been postponed until January 2023. So there's the one year for the discussion. And uh, also, the ministry announced that. Uh, there is uh, a lot of uh, discussion around it about the current shape and, and there were many comments from the public. And therefore, uh, as a minimum, there will be provided some explanations to these regulations, but uh, hopefully uh, the current shape of these regulations uh, would should change. Now, there's one maybe additional positive <laughs> aspect here. Apart from the moment of introduction of this regulation, we, we also have an exemption and uh, the exemption basically says that if the amount that you pay um, and the entire amount of the costs which have been classified as a hidden dividend is lower the amount of the gross profit generated by the Polish taxpayer, gross profit calculated uh, in accordance with accounting rules, then uh, the hidden dividend uh, rules would not apply. So if you look at the example, uh, in com company A, uh, in our example, has costs which have been classified as a hidden dividend uh, equal to 25. This is the line C. Uh, and it uh, shows the gross profit of 15 uh, for the entire year. So in this case, entire amount of 25 would be tax non-deductible. At the same time, uh, if you look at the company B, where you have costs classified as a hidden dividend equal to 15, but the gross profit is 25, the consequence is that the entire 15 would be tax deductible and uh, the exemption would apply. So that's that's about this regulation. Now, uh, the second uh, regulation, uh, which uh, I also wanted to mention, is the regulation which is already in place, uh, but uh, effectively will require some actions, mainly now from the taxpayers and also going forward. This is a regulation which imposes on every Polish taxpayer uh, to prepare the transfer pricing documentation if it concluded a transaction with unrelated party, if the beneficial owner is located in the tax haven. Now, this applies only to the transactions with unrelated parties where the total value in the given uh, financial year with a given counterparty is not higher than half a million slots. Um, and also this provision says that if you have a transactions with unrelated parties, uh, you also need to, to make a special test. You need to take certain steps uh, and, and uh, verify to what extent the uh, um, the unrelated party really has a beneficial owner of this transaction in the in the tax haven. W what it really means is uh, that you basically should either email or contact your unrelated party. So imagine what will happen if you have hundreds of thousands of, of, of the clients uh, to which you pay uh, significant amounts. Um, obviously, they don't need to, to reply to you, so you will not be able to, to, to have a answer whether you are obliged or not obliged to prepare this documentation. But if, if you don't don't have this answer, okay, this is at least one thing that you can you can prove that you have taken some steps to, to document it, but you should also take some additional steps, meaning either you should verify the uh, financial statements of, of the of these companies or maybe if possible there will be relevant data. You, you should also check the register of uh, beneficial owners. And only if you take appropriate steps and if you document and you will not be able to identify uh, any transaction of this unrelated party with uh, with a tax haven, 
uh, you can you can claim that you are uh, not required to prepare the transfer pricing documentation. So there is a lot of actually here um, uh, work which my view is will create a, a lot of unnecessary burden. Um, but uh, if you do not comply with these regulations, there are again fines for for the for the people who will not follow them. So effectively, a lot of additional work uh, without major benefit uh, for for the state. Um, so that's that's all from our side, uh, from international tax and transfer pricing perspective. Uh, uh, thank you, thank you for uh, listening to us. And now we will have a short break. Uh, the break will be until approximately 5.05, so have a coffee and please come back after the break. Thank you very much. Welcome back after the short break. Uh, the next session will be around personal income tax. My name is Katarzyna Komarowska and I'm partner in P People and Organization. And uh, how to start? So. Personal income tax, I think the changes uh, resulting from Polish deal are the most vocal and commented uh, in, in public space because they affect everyone, uh, both employers and employees and each person who earns something. Um, there are many changes in this area, uh, but uh, when we come, when it comes to the employees, uh, we can see the three groups of uh, of changes in regulations that affects the net income of each individual. Uh, the first one it relates the uh, brackets of uh, taxation and the tax free amount. Basically, uh, the threshold of the next, so the higher progressive tax rate uh, will be increased. At the same time, there will be increased tax-free amount. So as a rule, these changes should result in increasing the net salary. But there are also other changes that uh, works in different way. Um, the health insurance contribution will be no longer deductible from income tax, which results in the increasing of tax burdens and affecting the net salary of employees. The third one is the middle class tax relief. Uh, for employees and sole uh, entrepreneurs, uh, tax at uh, 17 and 32 percent, this will result and somehow uh, decreasing the effect of negative changes uh, for, for the so-called middle class. I will uh, then evaluate what kind of uh, income will uh, classify it as this one. So as I said, uh, uh, the above changes will affect the net income of individuals, assuming that the gross salary will not change. And we see the three groups of, uh, of affected uh, employees, uh, depending on the level of remuneration and gross salary. The first one, uh, so the, the, the employees with the lowest earnings uh, will be affected in the really remote way. And the, the, the effect will be a bit positive. So the annual net salary uh, for the employees who earns um, uh, approximately up to uh, 5,800 Polish Zlotys net monthly should increase a bit. There is a second group uh, which is covered by so-called uh, middle class tax relief. So people earning uh, between 5,700 and ele over 11,000 um, Polish what if monthly. Uh, for these uh, employees, generally, the Polish deal changes should be neutral. But the, the other employees will earn less. And this is the group earning over 11,000 um, 11, gross uh, salary monthly. Uh, what else? Uh, new complicated rules for setting remuneration may cause 
employers' problems with the correct calculation of tax advances and the total income and preparing respective documents in terms of payroll obligations. How, how um, this, let's say, changes um, cause the challenges uh, for the employers in the really near time, because this is, this is really soon when we're going to introduce the, the changes. First of all, as, as mentioned, uh, there will affect the net salary of the employees, but in a different way, depending on what is the gross salary currently. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we observe, apart from the changes resulting from the Polish deal, we're observing in Poland uh, quite significant inflation. These two factors, uh, I implementing of Polish deal, as well as really increasing inflation, in some groups of employees, we will face and see the growing wage pressure. This is really, this is really uh, important from the perspective of Polish employers because so far Poland is rather the market of an employee where there, there are a lot, of, a lot of challenges in obtaining talents so far. So the new changes may, may make it even more challenging. And as I mentioned before, even calculation or choosing the correct way of calculation of net income and reporting that may be more challenging and complicated for the employers. To give you some example, how effectively uh, this can influence uh, the, the Polish employer. Uh, assuming that uh, we have employment contracts, because I will be referring to contractors later on, uh, we can see that up to 140,000 Polish Zlotys annually, the level of, of net salary obtained by the, by the employees should remain more or less the same. But if employers decide to, let's say, compensate the negative impact of Polish deal to their employees, they need to expect really increase the cost of of the uh, of the, the employment costs. So, uh, on this example, you can see uh, how uh, how Polish deal uh, would affect um, the the employers depending on what is the level of the earnings of the employees. Uh, if they want to compensate that, uh, compensate that uh, based to the um, new, new regulation. For example, in the company, when we have 60 employees, 30 uh, with the salary 200k of Polish Zlotys and 30 of 300,000 uh, Polish Zlotys, the average increase of the cost of employment for this employer annually would be 1,100,000 Polish Zlotys, which is significant amount if we want to react on the Polish deal and compensate the remuneration uh, decrease in terms of the net salary of our employees. It is not only the employees who will be affected with the changes. Also, in case of the of the um, management board, so the person appointed to perform functions under so-called act of the of, of appointment, there will be also significant changes affected the net salary received. So far, this was the relationship that was not covered with uh, healthcare insurance. Now, uh, this this uh, kind of relationship will. Um, will be covered with the uh, healthcare insurance, which I remind you um, will not be deducted from tax. What is the the reaction of the of the of the employers and the and the firms uh, that we observe on the market? First of all, uh, we need to mention that Polish market, Polish um, employment market is very specific. 
uh, the B2B structure, so the structure based on the contractual agreement with entrepreneurs is quite popular comparing to other European countries. For example, uh, approximately 40% uh, for, for, uh, of current uh, technology uh, experts are engaged under B2B contracts. And, uh, and uh, this group of people are also subject to some changes resulting from Polish deal. Um, there are different ways of conducting an, uh, business activity by the individuals. And to make the world even more complicated, Polish deal introduces totally different ways of calculating the healthcare contribution and the way how taxation is applied. Depending on the nature of activity of the given contractor and the level of revenues and cost, different model, different tax structure can be more preferential and more relevant for, for, for these uh, entrepreneurs. Um, Polish deal uh, seems also some positive changes. For example, there is um, a, a lot of focus for, for uh, looking for beneficial and preferential taxation for IT sector, for example, for programmers, the there are changes in rates of taxation uh, under so-called structure with some on recorded revenues. So, so the lump sum of recorded revenues uh, and decreasing of the taxation down to 12%. But there is very important note, even though the legislator changes the ways of taxation of entrepreneurs, there is no change in terms of the conditions where the B2B structure can be introduced and uh, being run in the safe way. We need to remember that there is no such easy change between employment contract and B2B without restructuring the nature of the relation between us as an employer and the individual. So what should be the next steps that uh, the Polish employers should take looking at the changes in the regulations um, affecting individuals? First of all, uh, they should de de detect how the regulation affect the different groups of employees. As I mentioned, the Polish deal, um, the Polish deal regulation do not have to necessarily be negative from the perspective of the whole, all the gr all groups of, of employees. Therefore, uh, there should be the real case uh, by case analysis, how they affect different group of, of employees, uh, management board, contractors, and how they affect other costs of the company. Uh, second of all, uh, looking at the fact that uh, that there are different alternative forms of remunerating people in the organization current employers should look for the best and uh, most effective ways how to structure uh, current uh, relationship with their uh, employees um, the, the the next the next um, the next uh, area of let's say analysis and uh, reaction should be really the, the observation how the relation with entrepreneurs is structured now, how should it be, and what would be the most beneficial in the future after the future changes. This is really, let's say, fragile uh, uh, area that uh, we recommend to take a really specific look at because it is really highly promoted in the media, in, in some uh, public discussion, but at the same time, introducing this kind of structure requires a lot of due diligence so that it is really uh, introduced uh, uh, according to relevant regulation and safe from the tax perspective. And last but not least, uh, the communication process is crucial because as I mentioned, the Polish deal doesn't mean that everybody is earning less or more. 
the the current status and the complication of the regulation requires uh, quite strong uh, communication from the employer's side so that the employees and all the individuals uh, contracting in a different way know how it affects them individually. As it was mentioned in the first part of our uh, meeting, uh, we are here for you to answer your questions on the chat and uh, we will be there until the end of the, of the presentation. And I, I invite you for the last session uh, in this panel regarding the corporate income tax changes. Thank you very much. of our uh, presentation. My name is uh, Miete Gonta. I'm tax partner specializing in corporate income tax and uh, state aid uh, uh, issues. Uh, so uh, I will have the pleasure to walk you through uh, the remaining uh, part of the of the changes to Polish corporate income tax uh, law, maybe uh, using uh, uh, the <laughs> the the word pleasure is not the best when uh, I will be talking about the uh, minimum income tax, uh, so the new uh, tax that will be levied. But I promise to balance it with something more uh, sweet uh, in the second part of my presentation, when I will be uh, showing you new tax reliefs uh, in Poland. So um, going to this uh, minimum income tax con uh, concept, uh, I think from this slide, what I want uh, you to, uh, to take uh, off is, is that uh, this new tax will apply to all taxpayers, including tax groups in Poland, with a tax prof profitability less than 1% uh, or, of course, uh, experiencing uh, tax losses. So all these uh, uh, companies and, and taxpayers will be subject to this new tax. Uh, the tax base, maybe let's let's keep it general at this, at this stage, this will be 4% of so-called operational revenues. Uh, plus some uh, and extra elements. I will elaborate on this uh, a bit uh, later. Uh, and the tax rate that will be uh, applicable uh, is 10%. So generally, uh, I think mm, this is judging on what I see on the market. This is uh, possible that many businesses will fall into this new uh, tax uh, and monitoring of your position during the tax year, I think is, is, is crucial here. Uh, going uh, going further, um, so I would propose to to uh, let's let's have sort of uh, algorithm and and let's go together with certain steps that would help you to better understand the concept of this of this tax. Uh, so generally, the first the first question is uh, whether any of the tax exemptions uh, is is applicable uh, in your particular case. You have the full uh, list of these exemptions uh, uh, on the slide in front of you. Uh, I think that that uh, what I uh, draw your attention to would be these these um, industries, for example, financial companies, or or um, mineral extraction, international sea or air transport uh, companies. These are the, um, the the sectors that will be uh, uh, excluded from this new tax uh, without any further uh, conditions. Uh, also, startups. So, uh, within the first three year period of operations, companies should not be subject to this uh, new tax unless they are, they are let's say, then an outcome of any restructurings. Uh, so, um, that's uh, uh, also those uh, experiencing uh, significant drop uh, in revenues from year to year, especially in COVID times, that, that could be uh, maybe helpful. Uh, those are, are also exempt. Uh, but if you happen not to not to fall into in uh, any of these categories, uh, we need to go to to step two, and then uh, there is uh, you have the let's say the full fully fledged formula uh, of of this of this uh, criterion that I mentioned. Uh, so generally, again, your profitability, tax profitability, meaning uh, share of your income uh, in your tax uh, revenues, should be lower than. Uh, 1% or, or, of course, you must be uh, on, on a loss-making position in your tax reconciliation. 
one thing which is very important uh, capital expenditures uh, like like uh, of course costs uh, uh, resulting from acquisition of fixed assets uh, construction of fixed assets they shouldn't be included here so they should help uh, in in this in this equation uh, so uh, having uh, determine uh, whether you qualify for the taxation then there is an issue of of, of the tax base as i mentioned before 4% of revenues other than those from uh, capital gains. This is something that should be uh, relevant for uh, for you. And uh, of course, uh, as I mentioned, some elements that, that should be uh, added. And this is excessive uh, debt financing uh, towards the group. Uh, so uh, Swavek uh, mentioned this this uh, before in the, in the first uh, part of our presentation. So if, if your uh, financing costs exceeds uh, the 30% uh, of tax EBITDA, EBITDA uh, then uh, this excess should be added here and increase uh, your tax base. Uh, also, um, the famous Article 15E, we mentioned this before, uh, the cost of intangible services and, and uh, IP rights in an uh, excess uh, above 5% uh, of tax EBITDA uh, and uh, uh, plus 3 million. This is another element that will increase uh, the tax base for, for the taxation. Uh, going further, of course, here comes the step that is natural for, for all taxpayers, also in the standard corporate income tax reconciliation. So you have the right to deduct uh, certain elements from, from your tax base. So I mean here donations, uh, tax reliefs, uh, also those that I will uh, describe uh, later on. Uh, and also what should be deducted is the uh, um, uh, tax exempt income coming from special economic zone or, or Polish uh, investment zone. Uh, and then goes uh, the tax rate that I mentioned. So, uh, so established tax base should be multiplied by the 10% tax rate and then we have the, the uh, liability in this new minimum income tax. A uh, couple of words around the reconciliation of this, of this tax. Uh, so um, uh, generally you need to run this reconciliation parallelly to, to your standard corporate income, income uh, tax. Um, but of course uh, you have the right to deduct this uh, the standard uh, corporate income tax obligation from, from the minimum income tax that you will uh, calculate. And uh, the, the, the difference is also that this uh, minimum income tax should be calculated uh, once a year at the year end. So there, uh, there is no uh, advance payment uh, mechanism, mechanism provided for, for this new uh, tax. And uh, there is also the right that if you if you pay the uh, the tax uh, the minimum tax in a, in a single year you have uh, next uh, subsequent uh, uh, three years to um, deduct this tax from your standard corporate income tax if you if you start to pay it uh, in the in the amount about uh, in the in the proper amount. We have uh, prepared some uh, calculator. I will share with you at the end of our presentation the, the links uh, so you can use this calculator to roughly assess uh, your situation vis-a-vis uh, -vis this, this uh, current uh, this, this, uh, minimum income uh, tax. Um, maybe let's um, move to this a bit uh, sweeter uh, part uh, that, that I promised. Uh, so um, here we... Uh, here we have uh, a slide uh, about something which is partly sweet, but but uh, partly uh, still bitter. As a, uh, so, this uh, uh, limitation on deductibility of uh, intangible services costs, uh, we mentioned this many times. So yes, this will be removed, but uh, this will be removed only for those who uh, don't qualify for this uh, minimum income tax. So. This is sweet for, for this part of the market, but of course those uh, falling within uh, uh, the minimum income tax, as I mentioned, this will, be, uh, this will appear again as an element that will increase the tax base as I, as I described. The regulations are, are very, very similar. There are some uh, differences uh, that you can see on the slide. I will maybe not go into, into details uh, here, but what I wanted to 
mention and underline is, is the, what you have at the very bottom of, of this uh, slide. Uh, there is a possibility stemming from the grandfathering rules uh, on, the, on, the, on the edge of these new regulations. Um, all those who uh, had this excess of non-deductible uh, intangible uh, services costs in the past uh, got the right to deduct this uh, excess from previous years uh, in the FY in the uh, fiscal year 22. Uh, there are there are some uh, doubts and issues around how big this deduction uh, could be and and uh, whether you can deduct the whole amount of excess or, or whether it should be still limited. Uh, I will again. I will maybe not go into details here, but definitely this is something that uh, should be considered uh, because that's uh, a, a positive outcome of the of the Polish deal in this particular area. Uh, moving further, um, here you have um, two vehicles that that uh, are, are already existing in the Polish corporate income tax system. I mean here so-called Estonian uh, uh, tax regime and uh, tax groups, uh, which are also present in Poland for, for many years. Estonian uh, tax is something uh, introduced uh, last year. Uh, the general idea behind Estonian seat is to uh, postpone the uh, taxation of profits uh, generated in, in, uh, in the company uh, until the moment when these profits are distributed to the uh, to shareholders, so during before such a distribution, there is generally no tax uh, paid by such a company. This is uh, quite uh, interesting idea, but it wasn't uh, very popular in the in the last year because of quite strict conditions imposed by the by the um, legislators. Uh, so some of these conditions will stay. And for example, this is the, the requirement to have uh, uh, individual uh, as shareholders of, of such company. Uh, uh, only individuals could be shareholders and such a company cannot have, uh, cannot, uh, have uh, shares in any other companies. Uh, so this will remain, but uh, some of these conditions will uh, be changed or will uh, be withdrawn. And I, will, uh, I would like to draw your attention to uh, to two um, conditions, uh, one being the maximum uh, cap of revenue uh, of 100 million zlotys. So uh, in, in, the, in the current year, such a um, taxpayer couldn't uh, uh, qualify for this taxation uh, if uh, he had uh, revenues uh, exceeding this threshold. Um, as of the next year, this threshold will be removed. And also, the obligation to invest uh, and incur specific amount of uh, capital ex expenditures that was uh, in place in the previous year will also be uh, withdrawn as of the next year. So uh, hopefully this will make this vehicle more popular and more accessible uh, to taxpayers on the, on the market. Uh, speaking about tax grouping in Poland and tax groups, I think that the, 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 the key change is the one uh, referring to this 2% uh, profitability condition. Uh, generally, uh, that was, uh, let's say, sort of uh, killing factor in the past because the, um, on, on, uh, firstly, you had to uh, be sure that the, you will satisfy this 2% profitability condition throughout the whole period of operation of the, of the capital group. And if you failed to do so, you you uh, lost uh, the um, the status backwards. So that was something very very strict and uh, um, distracting many many companies in Poland from from choosing this this option. Currently, it will be removed. Uh, also, the um, the condition of of uh, the, the capital requirement uh, per company will be decreased from half million zlotys to 250,000 zlotys. Uh, I think also this, this uh, condition around uh, mergers, transformations uh, and divisions of the companies uh, in, the, in the group uh, and um, allowing this uh, within the groups would be of much help to, to make it more popular. Okay, uh, and 
now uh, now the dessert so uh, uh, the sweetest part uh, new tax reliefs uh, implemented by the by the tax uh, the, by the Polish deal uh, you have uh, you can see on the slide uh, uh, a, a wide bunch of, 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 of these reliefs mainly these are new completely new concepts the only one that is uh, being extended and ch and changed is R&D tax relief and as you can see they are mostly concentrated on on, on innovation processes uh, within within companies so uh, i wanted uh, on the next slide uh, before going into into more details around the particular um, reliefs i wanted uh, you to to uh, to see um, the let's say um, a, a, a bit of logic behind all this whole this system so as because as as the as the, uh, as the ministry said and as we see this uh, these uh, reliefs are are prepared to cover different phases of, of the innovation process uh, in in particular company uh, engaged in r d activities uh, so imagine such a such a um, uh, let's say a process from the very initial phase of, of, of uh, concept uh, idea uh, up to the, the the very mature stage of, of sales you can see that each of this of this uh, reliefs could be used in different in different uh, part of this of this process and uh, that would be also my strong suggestion to you to like look at this whole bunch of, of new reliefs in a more holistic and and strategic manner and try to to arrange them in a in a proper manner sequence because they are definitely interact uh, with each other and they might be some overlaps um, also some inefficiencies so proper structuring of the of the whole uh, process here could be of of, of great value uh, for the company so uh, let's go uh, into the let's say some deep dive into particular uh, mm, uh, reliefs uh, first of all we have this this r d the, the, the only one existing uh, so far this is quite popular and becoming more and more popular uh, tax relief uh, in poland uh, as of now we have the um, regulations allowing companies engaged in r d activities to deduct the cost of, of such activities not only once uh, during their uh, regular tax reconciliation but also once more in a hundred percent value so uh, another deduction against the tax base as a, as a uh, r d tax relief so these rules uh, will be changing as of the next year uh, and um, generally this extra deduction will grow uh, up to uh, 200 percent um, and depending on the state, state, uh, status of the of the company this will apply to to different categories of costs but generally uh, companies having the status of r d uh, centers they could uh, they will be able to benefit from the full 200 percent extra deduction on uh, in fact all or most of their of their costs uh, maybe r d centers are not uh, the most popular companies uh, in in poland so for all uh, other uh, companies uh, in poland uh, this extra 200 percent deduction will apply to costs of uh, salaries uh, of, of employees engaged in in r d uh, activities this is still quite nice portion of the of the whole uh, r d uh, deduction because this this type of of uh, uh, expenses based on my experience are are, are usually the, the the most significant so you you have some uh, on each side you will have some some uh, numerical example illustrating what i'm saying but i think it, it should be quite quite understandable and and i think this is quite significant change um, maybe enhancing you to to come back to to, to previous discussions around uh, r d uh, relief uh, if there was in, not enough uh, let's say uh, extra value for you in the past maybe currently under the new regime that would uh, change uh, another uh, thing uh, still stemming from the r d tax uh, relief uh, is the new relief for innovative employees in general 
for all those who are deducting uh, R&D uh, uh, tax relief and they have not enough uh, income to utilize this, this uh, um, relief, uh, we have new relief uh, allowing these companies to utilize this non-deducted part of R&D tax relief against, um, against uh, personal income tax advances uh, on salaries paid to uh, employees engaged in R&D activities. Uh, as you can see on the slide, the, the precondition to qualify a given employee as, a, as, as, a, as a one engaged in R&D activities is that uh, he sh or she should be engaged in, in, a, uh, in at least 50% uh, of, of working time during given given month. And uh, one thing also worth mentioning is that uh, the eligibility to, to deduct this, this um, extra um, tax relief will be starting uh, in the month following the month uh, in which you submitted the uh, uh, corporate income tax return for the previous year. So in Poland, you have three months for, for, for such uh, submission under, under standard rules. If you, if you uh, manage to do it earlier, you have simply more months to to because the the, the let's say the limitation is the the end of the calendar year. So as as you can see on the on the slide, um, if you submit the declaration in January, for example, you can uh, deduct this extra uh, relief starting from February up to December uh, of of a given calendar year. So I think this is sort of cashback that that you are receiving uh, if you uh, if you now are, are not able to reconcile the the, the whole amount of um, R&D tax relief of course it's not cashback per se because it's not directly into your, po into your pocket but that's let's say another opportunity to utilize as much as possible out of this R&D tax relief uh, then goes completely new uh, tax relief uh, for prototypes. Generally, taxpayers conducting R&D activities uh, who who incurred uh, are in, who are uh, incurring costs uh, for trial production of new products or, or introducing these uh, new products to the to the market are uh, eligible to deduct uh, as an extra deduction. 30% of such costs uh, from the from the tax base so apart from the 100% uh, deducted in the in the regular uh, corporate income tax reconciliation this is extra 30% deduction uh, this is limited to the 10% of of income derived from from uh, sources other than capital gains in in a in a given year Mm, and you have on the slide the list of uh, of uh, expenditures that are um, eligible here for the for the deduction. Maybe of of course you can you can deduct costs of of fixed assets purchased for for the sake of trial production raw materials. But I would draw your attention to certification costs as an example of costs that uh, couldn't be. Uh, couldn't have been deducted against the um, R&D tax relief because certification wasn't qualified as something falling within this, this the scope of this relief, and this relief for for prototypes gives this this right. So it it, it shows as an example the the let's say the um, uh, the idea I presented at the very beginning of this part uh, where where this uh, both of these. Uh, reliefs are, are strictly correlated and and it interacting with each other uh, so so that's that's uh, i think a good example of of this another uh, mm, relief is relief for uh, robotization uh, um, it was uh, it has been uh, longly awaited uh, we discussed this uh, many times with uh, different businesses in in, in poland finally uh, we got this uh, this is 50% of extra deduction of costs, but remember these are uh, for depreciation, so these are not capex that you, know, you are not eligible to deduct the whole amount of capex you you incurred in a given year. You are eligible to deduct the cost of depreciation for this particular year. So 50% of this of this, uh, this cost. Uh, could be uh, could be extra uh, deducted, and again, there is the limit of uh, 
in, in, in this time the, the full amount of income from sources other than capital gains in a given year, uh, you are not allowed to, to uh, deduct uh, uh, more than, than this, uh, this cap. And uh, I didn't mention this before, in, in previous uh, reliefs you, you got some, some uh, mecha vehicles for uh, carrying uh, this uh, unknown uh, utilized uh, amounts of, of reliefs for next periods. Uh, here there is no uh, such, uh, such a possibility. You have the, on the right hand you have some numerical example showing how this uh, uh, relief uh, will operate in, in, in practice. Uh, relief for expansion, another, um, I, let's say this is something for, for uh, very late stages, uh, I mean uh, it's related to sales and generally this is uh, for businesses aiming to expand their operations via increasing sales of, of new products or, or um, products uh, on uh, uh, new product, uh, on new markets or increasing sales of, of uh, existing uh, products. There is quite uh, maybe difficult in practice uh, criterion to be satisfied because you must show that within two years you achieved higher uh, revenues thanks to incurring this cost. So that could uh, cause some, some difficulties in practice. Uh, generally this, this uh, tax relief is capped uh, with uh, one million uh, of um, uh, Polish uh, uh, zlotys in a, in a given uh, tax year. Mm, and you have some, the, the list of, of some exemplary uh, expenditures that can qualify for this, for this relief. Uh, so of course, uh, participation in, in, in FERS, some promotional um, activities uh, or uh, tender documentation all these uh, elements could qualify for the for the new uh, relief. And finally, uh, last but not least, <laughs> we have the mm, CSR relief. Uh, so, uh, um, if uh, the taxpayer is incurring costs for sport, educational, or, or, or cultural activities, um, I think we should mean here mainly sponsorship activities and uh, treat this cost as tax deductible, uh, the, the relief allows him uh, to uh, did, uh, extra deduct 50% of such uh, uh, tax deductible costs uh, within this CSR uh, relief. Uh, what is worth mentioning is that uh, this, uh, this relief um, relates uh, only to uh, a cost incurred to the favor of institutions. So individual sponsorship uh, shouldn't be uh, in included uh, here. So if you are sponsoring uh, an individual uh, sportsman, that is not qualifying, but sports club uh, is uh, of course uh, eligible. Mm, another criterion is that uh, it shouldn't be, uh, uh, the, let's say, um, the, the institution aiming to earn money. So we, you, you should seek for for other type of, of institutions, you, you have the, the list here um, on the on the slide. Uh, I think that that's good idea to review the existing sponsorship agreements uh, that you have in the context of this of this new relief. Also, when when entering into new arrangements, I think it, it's it should be verified to to have at the back of your head that this extra deduction should be quite I, I hope quite easily. Uh, um, uh, realized. So uh, I think that uh, I have, I can now uh, have the pleasure uh, to thank you for uh, for uh, uh, your attendance, uh, for your questions. Uh, ask, uh, we have our uh, moderators on the line, so of course you can ask them still, and 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 uh, we will be pleased to come back to you with our, our uh, answers uh, right now or or later. Uh, we have also some um, materials on our websites. I strongly encourage you to visit these uh, websites. Uh, the calculator of minimum income tax I mentioned is uh, just an example. So many interesting articles and materials can be found uh, there. So many thanks for your attention uh, and see you during our next uh, events.